Uh, true that many Islamic countries have only recently emerged from a period of domination by the West. But if we take a longer view of history, we can recall that that was preceded by centuries in which Islam held a lead, culturally as well as politically, from which it was only slowly dislodged. And in the modern global world, it's surely time to cast aside this sort of rivalry and for nations and cultures to look on each other and to feel themselves as equals uh, despite the history of conflict. But more profoundly, what it seems to me that the world is witnessing is a shift from earlier models of religion and from the kinds of society that were built on those models. The shift affects Judaism, Christianity and Islam equally. And indeed, precedents might be sought under the Abbasid Caliphate in Iraq, for instance, or in Andalus. However, it seems to have got underway most effectively in the early modern period in the Christian West. In essence, this shift is a move away from a world of absolutism, where it was generally accepted that religious leaders were in possession of final truth on everything that mattered, to a world where a good deal of ignorance is acknowledged, and where knowledge is seen as something acquired gradually, gradually falteringly, and through collective effort. Society is no longer structured as a hierarchy with those in possession of the ultimate truth determining how everyone should behave. That is why democratic models have come to the fore, and the authority of priests and hereditary rulers has waned. This is not a conflict between Islam and Christianity, even if by some historical accident there might be at this time an Islamic majority on one side, a Christian majority on the other. It is rather a, hum a universal human struggle to adjust to what we loosely call modernity, and people of all faiths are equally involved. Traditional religious leaders, Jews, Christians and Muslims equally, find this development threatening, and not without reason, since it certainly undermines their authority and deprives them of the opportunity to control society in the ways in which they did for so many centuries. And even among their followers, some feel insecure and tend to seek security by attending to the more extreme fundamentalist interpretations of their faith. While others are quite happy to be able to shrug off the more onerous aspect of religion or to abandon it altogether in favor of a more radical secularism. So Dr. Him, Dr. Sahim characterized the Muslim response to recent developments as twofold. One, a strong traditionalist reactionary perspective, and two, an equally categorical secularist modernist position. And this is precisely what has been happening in all our faith communities. And that is why it's so valuable for all of us to engage in dialogue with each other as well as with the secular administration we need to discover how to relate to the modern world without abandoning our individuality, the individuality of our communities. My next question is whether religion can be reduced to values. Uh, Dr. Sahin urged that Muslims should draw on traditional Islamic values, particularly that of Ijtihad, which he understands as critical engagement, to engage in dialogue with Western secular democracy. Sustained cultural engagement, he observed, demands considerable skill. But my question here is, how are Islamic values to be defined, seeing that Islam is so complex and varied a tradition? There can, of course, be no simple answer to this. Islam has sacred texts, schools of interpretation, and schools of law. It's certainly possible to discern within the sources of Islam, elements of what are seen in the West as liberal enlightened values. But it is also possible to find texts or interpretations that are intolerant, discriminatory, or unduly restrictive. The scholarly aspect of this question can be settled easily. Yet it is possible to discern within the sources of Islam elements of what are seen in the West as liberal enlightened values. Some of them arguably arose within Islamic societies. But the practical aspect of the question is more difficult, and that is, how can Muslim communities ensure that it is these values that are actually promoted in their midst? 
My second question is whether it is really possible, even in theory, to reduce Islam, or for that matter any of our traditional religions, to a set of ethical and moral values. We've all had liberal groups in our faith communities who have attempted to do this. But surely there's far more to religion than ethical and moral values. There are laws, we have halakha, sharia, rituals, history, legends, spiritual exercises, and a whole vocabulary shared by the faithful and which articulates their relationships with God, with each other, and with the world. And it's this which makes each faith group distinctive. Often enough, it's these aspects of the religious life which impinge on public space. And so a balance must be struck between the desire to retain distinctiveness as a religious community <coughs> and the need for coherence in society as a whole. I'll next mention some of the issues where secular and religious values, in any case, uh, conflict. Equal status of women before the law is perceived by traditionalists in some religions as an attack on their values. British society has, however, developed to a point where there's a strong consensus for gender <coughs> equality and where legislators can insist on this, at least in the public sphere. There are countries with institutionalized churches, for instance, Sweden, which have insisted on the equality of sexes within the churches to the extent that women should have equal rights to priesthood. This seems to me a wrong solution to a dilemma of government. Far better indeed to disestablish the church and for government to interfere in matters that touch church doctrine. Social groups vary considerably in their attitudes to relations between the sexes and to the use of alcohol and other mind-altering substances. This is often the real cause of friction between communities. Though the communities themselves may deny this, and so lead sociologists to look for causes elsewhere. Indeed, the demand for denominational schools, it seems to me, stems in large part from this sort of consideration. Religious parents are reluctant to expose their children to the sexual freedom and substance abuse that they feel that they would be met if they allowed their children to mix with others in the state sector. It seems to me, uh, and a lot of this arises from my contacts in the Jewish community, that such issues are in fact far more deeply divisive than the relatively superficial but headline attracting matters, such as whether Muslim girls are to wear veils in school or Christians sport crucifixes or Jewish boys keep their heads <coughs> covered at lesson. Finally, uh, I'll pick up again on the uh, statement of Dr. Sahin in his paper that secularity should not be thought of as a rejection of religion, and whereas secularism places scientific rationality at the heart of the humanistic endeavor and additionally insists that reason ought to supersede religion. Now, there is indeed a kind of secularism that, it seems to me, relates to true liberal and democratic ideals in much the same way as extremist religion relates to true faith. It's a distortion and a parody. This, of course, is no reason to reject scientific rationality, provided the scientific rationality is not allowed to run away with itself and make pronouncements about matters beyond its reach. Religion and science indeed must respect each other, take care not to invade, invade each other's sacred territory, and also not be afraid to learn from one another. So I conclude with a fulsome endorsement of Dr. Sahin's conclusion in his paper that the public and therefore political space, informed by the values of justice, respect and tolerance, holds the clue to perpetuating an egalitarian and just social order. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perhaps a quick round of applause for all of us.